Hello and welcome everyone to today's presentation on the uh, SNEA NSF. Uh, what storage define what software defined storage means to storage networking. I'm going to be your moderator today, Tim Lustig. And before we start here, I just want to introduce the uh, our presenters for you today. We've got two very distinguished individuals. First, we have uh, Ted Vonich who is a CTO for external storage at Lenovo and for the Enterprise Business Group. He focuses on defining and implementing the external storage product portfolio. Ted has over 15 years of experience in the data storage industry and holds various positions in storage architect, storage solutions, as well as storage product development. He has authored several technical public pro public presentations and white papers on storage, and Ted holds a bachelor's degree in electrical computing engineering from the Pennsylvania State University and a master's degree in computer engineering from North Carolina State University. As well as this, uh, Ted also holds numerous patents in storage and networking technologies. Our other presenter is Fred Bauer. Fred is a distinguished engineer at Lenovo with over 20 years of experience in scalable systems based upon Intel architecture, including manufacturing and product development roles as a software engineer and architect. Fred was a graduate of Oregon State University with a BS in mechanical engineering and holds a master's in computer science and engineering, and as well received his PhD in computer science at Duke University, where he focused on processor microarchitecture and completed his research on fine grain, hard fault tolerance, and multi-core -core cache hierarchy designs. So you can tell we've got a good group of characters today to help present. Uh, before we get started with that, though, just want to introduce you a little bit to SNEA. Uh, so just a couple of things. SNEA is a global industry organization chartered with advancing the adoption of storage. Within the charter, it also uh, we, we re remain neutral and um, represent over 185 industry-leading organizations with over 2,000 active contributing members. As a global organization, SNEA reaches over uh, 50,000 users worldwide and focuses on standard adoption and, of course, the reason why we're here today, education. SNEA stands for the Storage Networking Industry Association. It's a nonprofit organization. Uh, within uh, this industry in association, there are multiple different uh, technology-focused areas. Uh, NSF is a network storage forum, and we focus on everything. Uh, you can see the check marks to the uh, down the center here, Ethernet, iSCSI, all the way down to our topic today, software-defined storage. And with that said, uh, we're just going to go over one last thing, and that's the uh, SNEA legal notice. Our lawyers make us say this. Again, it shouldn't surprise anyone. It's standard legal talk. The material you'll be seeing today is copyrighted by SNEA. And the use of any material within this presentation is permitted as long as a slide is reproduced in its entirety and SNEA is referenced as a source. Also be aware there are no warranties expressed or implied information that is going to be presented today. Uh, what, you'll be, uh, what you'll be hearing and using uh, or you can use at your own risk. On to the agenda real quick. See here we've got a, a, a pretty full um, schedule. We'll be taking up about the entire uh, time, a whole hour. Um, please hold your questions to the end. You can use the chat feature uh, to your right to send your questions in. Uh, we'll go ahead and as time permits, we'll get to those questions. Most likely we'll be holding off the majority of them to the end, but we may do some of them in between some of the, uh, um, the, uh, the sections here. We'll start off going over uh, exactly what is software-defined storage. We'll go over uh, commodity hardware, and then we'll kind of compare and contrast that to traditional and then go into some of the other means uh, like converged infrastructure and hyperconverged in infrastructure. And we'll say, talk about how they relate to the cloud models, and we'll talk about comparisons, and then the future trends. As I mentioned, hold your questions to the end. And use the chat feature uh, on your right to send your questions in to, to, the, uh, uh, to myself. With that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our first presenter, which will be Ted. Uh, Ted, why don't you take it away with the uh, basic definitions at the top here? Uh, yes, thank you, Tim. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Terms and, and descriptive acronyms and so on. 
So what I wanted to do here was just define some basic definitions that can be referenced later. Um, you know, as far as that goes, I'm not necessarily going to go down through each one, um, but, it, but essentially you can use this as a reference later on if, if you're reviewing this offline. Okay? Um, so let's talk about uh, what is software-defined storage versus traditional storage, right? Software-defined storage, it's really comprised of several nodes of commodity server hardware. One U server, two U server, two sockets, etc. And on top of each of those nodes, you'll have some storage-focused software. It may be uh, software that it picks up some open source and complements it, or it may even be just a homegrown proprietary software stack. And these nodes are then clustered to form a storage solution, and, and we'll get into more of why they're clustered. Um, but essentially, you need a minimum number of these tied together in this cluster to provide software-defined storage. In contrast, uh, just for, for a, a perspective, um, traditional storage, right, it's usually a, a storage appliance. Uh, this is optimal or purpose-built hardware, um, and it's usually comprised of proprietary software, storage software on that. Um, and, if, and as far as those things coming together in a single platform or single enclosure, they provide the uh, necessary features for delivering reliable storage. Okay, so let's tunnel down a little bit on software-defined storage, right? So again, it was commodity hardware, right? And, um, running uh, storage software could be open source or open, could be proprietary, could be a mix. For example, someone might have some Linux uh, kernel, and he may put some storage-specific services on top of it, such as dedupe or snapshots or whatever. The commodity hardware, usually an x86-based, uh, Intel, and now with AMD gaining momentum, there will be some open source or um, software-defined storage based on AMD. And you know, it really becomes down, it comes down to uh, picking hardware that meets a few storage requirements. In other words, when you're doing SDS, you don't get wrapped up into a long list of attributes that the hardware must support. It's really more about the processor architecture or some Linux support and you know, some adapter bays and drives. Um, from a storage architecture standpoint, uh, software-defined storage is really a shared nothing uh, architecture, meaning each node uh, uh, with running the software stack owns its drives, and no other node can see those drives directly. They, they can certainly talk to software stack to software stack and get some information, but the other nodes do not have direct access to the drives. And this is primarily to uh, manage the writes to the drives. If you had two uh, nodes trying to write the same drive, you can uh, have collisions and so on. Uh, Solutions, again, is a scaled-out cluster. You might have N nodes, each of them with M drives interconnected via Ethernet. And there's usually a solution-level management going on for the storage piece and uh, some platform management for each of the servers. Now, from a traditional storage standpoint, again, we talked about it's a proprietary or optimal appliance running proprietary software. Usually, again, it's an x86 arch uh, processor architecture, but there'll be things like power protection for the cache, and there'll be like inner controller communications between the two nodes residing in one platform. The architectures are shared everything, meaning each node, or I'm sorry, each controller has access to all the drives. Now, there are constructs like uh, reservations and so on to say which controller actually owns that drive in, at that point in time, but from a hardware or an architecture standpoint, there are paths from each controller to all the drives, and, they, and they, they're therefore coordinated. Um, and what this common access does, it actually allows you to do some high availability within one platform versus having multiple nodes. The solution, you could have a single platform with the two controllers, or you could actually have a group of them and clustered at a higher level to provide a unified namespace across them or whatever from a, a host access or a application server access. And storage and platform management is really within the platform itself. Uh, you rarely get a separate node or a separate management node trying to manage these kind of platforms. 
So here's a couple pictures to compare and contrast, right? On the left, you can see software-defined storage, and you can see the, the key attribute there is when he's doing a write, he may write to the node that owns the content, but that node is also sending copies to the other nodes in the cluster in case the owning node fails. Um, whereas on reads, if the node's up, he'll just take the data. Um, whereas in a traditional storage on the right, uh, they'll maybe, you know, he's going to write to the controller that owns it. He uh, obviously can make a copy across the internal links to, from a cache standpoint. It doesn't necessarily make a persistent copy. It's a relatively temporary copy until he commits it to the drives. Um, so then you, you start uh, uh, elevating this up a little bit, and you've got converged infrastructure, which can be SDS or traditional storage, but the compute and the network are added to the solution, and the, the uh, scaling of the various components, compute, storage, fabrics, are independent, so you can add more compute versus adding more storage. You don't have to do them in lockstep. And the, and the solution management ma actually manages all that compute and fabric and storage all together. Hyperconverge is really a fixed building block, basically a converged infrastructure, but it's all packaged in one platform. And you, when you scale, you've got to scale sort of a lockstep, meaning another building block with additional CPU or uh, servers, additional fabric, additional storage, even if you don't necessarily need it. Again, the solution management's within there. Um, so you can get a view of what, what those look like. Uh, um, essentially, the converged infrastructure is more of a, a virtual conceptual kind of an arrangement, whereas hyperconverge is everything's actually packaged in one platform. Um, okay, so then uh, this provides some networking challenges uh, trans uh, from traditional to uh, software-defined and, and, and uh, CI and ACI challenges. Um, I think, uh, uh, Fred, you want to go ahead and comment on some, some of this? Yeah, so it, it just as, as a little more introduction on my background, I come from the perspective of the server designer or the server implementer. Uh, with, with an emphasis on the management of the platform in the software domain. And so when we look at these software-defined solutions, including the converged and the hyper-converged infrastructure, what we see happening is uh, an elevation of a lot of traditional storage functionality into a general purpose programming environment. So you have a, a wider community contributing, but that wider community is using common elements like Ethernet. Um, you know, traditional networking sorts of things versus in a dedicated uh, traditional storage infrastructure, you might just have a fiber channel connection which is dedicated to the device. Um, but what, what this does bring in is this idea that you may be sharing that network. So ty typically in an Ethernet scenario, you're going to have your workload traffic, your storage traffic, possibly management traffic, and multiple nodes competing for the same physical link. Now, there are a number of uh, methods that can be employed to allocate bandwidth on that physical link, uh, but when you do that, you, of course, get some uh, fragmentation. Uh, if you reserve a certain amount of bandwidth for your storage traffic and you're not utilizing all of that bandwidth, well, there's always that temptation that you could uh, oversubscribe or utilize that for other purposes if you had a different mechanism in place. And that's one of the areas that you will see software-defined implementations vary in what they do around the networking. And often you will see software-defined network overlays at layer two, layer three, or even higher up the stack introduced to help with some of this optimization and tuning of the entire ecosystem. And this is one of the challenges, this, this extra complexity. You have more knobs and dials that you can turn than in the traditional enclosed unit. Um, and you, you have to kind of get it right in order to get the performance you would expect out of the hardware that you've purchased. Um, and, and the other thing to note when you do this tuning is that your network topology may have um, a, a configuration that introduces variable latency for your IOs. And most workloads tolerate some amount of variability in that IO transaction time, the round trip time, uh, but there will be boundaries you don't want to pass. And uh, the software-defined solutions tend to have more instances where you're at risk of having 
stalled IOs or IOs dropped, and, and that sort of thing requires resiliency in the software stack in order to make up for the fact that your solution may be competing for this shared resource of the network. The other thing to note on uh, the software-defined spectrum is this idea that a lot of additional services that are provided as part of the solution are implemented as a virtual machine or a container that is that to the workload is just a bump in the wire or analogous to that old bump in the wire uh, type implementation where you have all of the traffic being routed through the service to get whatever processing is done by the service completed in the software domain before being shuttled back down into the hardware to whatever you know endpoint in the the topology you're going to that routing does create traffic flows within your solution that also have to be tuned and optimized. And you'll see in a lot of the hyperconverged infrastructures, those flows are self-optimizing uh, by nature of the value out of the hyperconvergence, knowing that you can migrate workload or storage independent of one another to optimize traffic in the network and to provide resiliency or redundancy in the solution are, are elements that are leveraged by those solutions in this kind of a topology. So to add another layer of complexity on top of this, um, we are now seeing um, application of storage networking and storage in general in cloud environments. And where this gets really interesting is in hybrid cloud environments where you have an on-premise uh, component to your workload and your storage uh, and something out in the public cloud. But before we, before we get into the, the complexity of that, let's just talk a little bit about public cloud and some of the appeal of that to um, the consumers that are using that today. So when you have everything out on the cloud service provider platform, it's all managed by the cloud service provider. So you, you have an abstraction of what you have purchased. You've purchased capacity, uh, capacity for workload in the form of CPU virtual machine workload, capacity for storage in the form of an amount of I.O. and possibly a performance metric on that I.O. Um, so the public cloud gives you this, this lovely abstraction where you can have virtually infinite capacity, um, and typically your, your uh, uh, middle-of-the-road performance because good enough is good enough for a lot of cloud workloads. Um, a lot of what 10 years ago would have been targets for virtualization, uh, elements that we would take from a bare metal server and, and convert into a virtual machine running on general purpose hardware, those are the, the very first candidates that were uh, promoted to the cloud because they don't have a high dependency on uh, tailored performance from the platform they're running on and they, they can be fairly portable across uh, different topologies in terms of uh, two socket two U versus a two socket one U. Those sorts of things are less important to this type of workload. So there's a great simplicity argument for going to the cloud for these sorts of workloads. Um, and the nice thing about them is that all the storage is in the cloud. Your solution management, if you have some, is, is all interfacing cloud interfaces. So your favorite cloud provider provides you with a set of primitives, you utilize those primitives, and you get a bill at the end of the month. And as long as your bill is acceptable, you're a pretty happy customer. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is that you don't have a lot of control over that beyond these contracts that you have with the cloud provider. So the CSP implements all those storage services. You, you check the box of what you want dedupe or backup or whatever additional storage services on top of your base offering, and that's the end of the conversation. You're, you get the what, not the how, um, and then the cloud provider provides everything. So for a lot of workloads, that's very adequate, and, and that, that's a very simple, from a networking perspective, it's very simple for the implementer because everything is up in the cloud, and the cloud is worrying about the complexity of managing that connectivity between storage and compute and workload. In the hybrid cloud domain, however, you have uh, this problem that your, your data is, is at rest in the cloud and at rest on premise, and you maybe want to transit it between the two. And there are varying degrees of how that works or how, how complicated that gets. Um, so on premise, you might not have a high capacity. You might, but, but generally speaking, if you're operating at hybrid cloud, you're splitting your capacity between on prem and in the cloud but you might have higher performance close to a workload that has a high performance demand. That cloud footprint, again, large capacity, um, you're probably not going for high performance because 
testing data from cloud, and that transit has a high latency associated with it just by uh, you know definition of the separation between your premise and the cloud. Um, so they, you still have this simplicity argument in the cloud, but there is this extra element of having to manage where the data is at the moment you need it. So there's a cost associated with going between the public cloud and on-prem. Typically, that's taking up Ethernet to get out to the the public cloud, um, and that's a you know a, a link that may be um, contended for by multiple elements, including your your workload. So storage architectures on-premise could be software-defined, converged, hyper-converged even traditional storage, um, but there's now a new set of services that are required to provide that shuttling of the data to the solution architecture. So caching, backup services, workload migration, edge to cloud data management, all of these topics are kind of on the horizon or in the forefront of the conversation now around what you do around data management. Because at the end of the day, data is the currency of the workload, and it's, it's the first class citizen that we're trying to uh, give preferential treatment to provide value to our customers. So this picture is just kind of a, a you know a diagram of that on-prem footprint uh, in the trapezoid, and then the the depiction of the off-prem cloud elements. And you notice the big blue arrow. That's that's you know typically what we're seeing is just an Ethernet connection that's routing a set of storage services to the local. Uh, elements of the application stack. And that conversation can be storage to storage, so cloud storage to local storage, or it can be local workload to cloud storage and local workload to local storage. Both of those topologies exist. In those different topologies, you get a different uh, uh, management conversation in terms of the awareness required and the interaction between workload and data and cloud uh, in terms of you know who's managing when the when the flows go where so all of this adds complexity to the conversation around application topology and application architecture um, this is this is an area where it generally speaking there is a high degree of interaction between the solution architect the storage architect and the cloud architect if you have those independent roles in an organization. Did you have anything to say on this picture? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, as, as far as uh, you're looking at the on-premise component as well as the cloud component, the on-premise piece, typically the storage will have a little higher performance, lower latencies, but a modest amount of capacity. Whereas in the cloud, you'll have huge capacities, you'll have somewhat longer latencies and probably lower performance. So where you place the data in terms of those aspects, you know, you have to have some forethought and so on to make sure where the data sits is, uh, meets your uh, SLAs or quality of service for the particular application you're, you're after. And, and, and then also, you know, one step further, someone, you know, there are people who put VMs in clouds who might come to local storage just to, because you're, you're the, the data is, is the, the family jewels or the, the, the important piece, and you don't really care about the VM, but the point is I've got control of my data, and the cloud VM can come down, go the other way basically, and pick up data from uh, you know, uh, the site in Raleigh versus the site in, in uh, you know, St. Louis. Right? So you've got those kind of aspects as well that you can um, uh, involve here when you're making these decisions. Okay, so you know if you distill down some of the, some of the approaches, right? SDS um, as well as CI and ACI may be simpler to implement. No traditional storage corner cases about failover and power events and trying to protect the cache and things like that. Um, one of the things you you do have to keep in mind, though, you know SDS has that allure of commodity hardware and so on. Given the fact that you're you're actually having a group of nodes work as a cluster, the overall solution cost uh, doesn't necessarily translate to being cheaper than traditional storage. Or to, to enable the flexibility of services, VMs, cloud interface, etc. Um, in terms of uh, performance, certainly can be customized by the the uh, 
type of hardware you use, right? Let's assume you're all x86 and DRAM. You could get a two socket, four socket, or you could go try to be as cheap as possible, get a one socket with minimal memory. The point is, as long as it meets the storage requirements, you've got that latitude. From a cloud standpoint, um, since the storage is abstracted, um, you can uh, you don't even have to get caught up in the in the details of how to build off the solution, right? Um, and if you especially if you're a pure off premise, you don't even have to waste you know a lot of effort trying to figure out what exactly is your your detailed storage architecture. On the traditional storage side, right, it's complex. Um, but can be higher cost depending on what tier you're going after, but you do have higher performance in general, and you, know, you can certainly scale the storage capacity piece of this uh, typically much higher than you can on the per node SDS. Just as a perspective, the, uh, you may have met, uh, not caught this, but on SDS you have to make copies of data across the nodes. So in, essentially, you know, if I have a four node cluster, then whatever drives I have on that given node, I'm only really using 25% of them. The other 75% is to catch copies from other nodes. And so you've got to weigh that, that as, because in traditional storage, you don't have to have that overhead per se. So one other thing I'd like to point out is that as we have matured into an era where software defined, converged, and hyper converged, are now deployed widely in enterprises and, and fairly common, one of the influences that has had on server design is that those are considered first class workloads when we look at our next generation cabinet design or IO design. So this is a this is one of these elements where the, the, the commodity hardware, and I'm air quoting, which you can't see, commodity hardware is starting to be influenced by the requirements of storage, which makes it look a little bit more like purpose-built storage hardware in some instances. Um, and, and similarly, the traditional storage devices that we are seeing produced, if you open them up, they have a lot of commodity components in them. So if you, if you stand far enough away from the rack, and look, you will notice that these things do look similar to one another, but it's, it's about where the emphasis is on customization in the design. And in the, in the case of hyperconvergence or convergence, it's also about integrating workload into the storage fabric in a way that we previously weren't really doing before we, we invented these constructs. Um, I see a question on the chat, and this is probably the right time to address it. So erasure coding used in software-defined storage and and replication versus erasure coding. It's a good point there. So Ted mentioned the, the, you know, just copies of data across disks. That's certainly the simplest way to ensure that you have a- In the first generation way. Exactly. So, so are we starting to see erasure coding used? Certainly we are. And there's a, a long history of that from, from RAID in particular. Um, but as we have new technologies that have different failure modes, and we're looking at you know, a model of failing a component versus a, a whole node in a cluster, um, that's driving the conversation around what, which is the appropriate erasure coding to implement. And one of the things I should have mentioned earlier is in the bump in the wire conversation is this idea that uh, things like erasure coding are ripe for offload. And so y again, having a general purpose server with an offload engine or an FPGA that has been programmed to be an offload engine starts to look like a purpose-built device, but it's still commodity hardware in the SDS conversation. So it's fair to say we're gonna build a software-defined construct on top of that. And, and absolutely, you will see erasure coding as a technique to optimize the amount of storage available from the raw capacity in your cluster. Yeah, so there's the one other aspect. So in many, many times in computer, computer industry, you have to weigh off the complexity of processing versus the significance of capacity, right? Clearly make replication is much simpler than doing eraser coding, but eraser coding is much more efficient with the capacity, even though on an error it takes much, much, uh, much higher uh, processing power to reconstruct the data. So, you know, clearly that's one of those things where depending on your uh, implementation or your desire, you, you know, you have to make the right choices. You, you may want a two socket server if you're doing eraser coding because you want the have sufficient resources to rebuild that data quickly. 
Okay, so here's sort of a, a general comparison between what you're doing with SDS and what you're doing with traditional. Um, you know, cer certainly you can have um, block, file, and object in an SDS uh, solution. You can certainly do that in traditional storage, um, but usually you don't find, find block, I'm sorry, find object storage based on a traditional storage controller. Objects more about, you know, I've got a big scale out cluster, maybe I got hundreds of nodes and petabytes of storage, and that's pretty hard to put in a single uh, 2U enclosure or whatever. Architecture, um, you have seven nodes, each or several nodes for software defined storage. Each is a shared nothing architecture. And in traditional, it's a single platform with a shared everything architecture. Um, from a host interface standpoint, um, Software defined storage is predominantly Ethernet, but I'm sure there is somebody out there doing fiber channel or InfiniBand, so I wouldn't necessarily want to um, limit that. Uh, whereas on traditional storage, you'll get uh, Ethernet and fiber channel, probably a little more fiber channel than Ethernet, um, and there are guys who will do InfiniBand on that. Um, from a high availability, right, you may have node errors, and that's going to jump to one of the other nodes in the cluster. Um, in fact, to the point where you may have failure domains, you may have a cluster of 32 nodes, and you may have failure domains of four nodes each, so that if something happens, you'll fail over to one of those four and not not to everybody, and you don't necessarily have to do eraser code or, or uh, copies to 32 nodes. You just stay within your failure domain. On traditional controllers, you'll fail over to his peer, um, and then on both cases, when I have disk errors, I may do some RAID or Frankly, you could even do eraser coding within a node if you wish. Um, from a failure domain standpoint, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you've got a group of nodes, uh, some subset of the overall cluster. Um, and then from an HCI standpoint, it's usually within the platform building block, right? You, you may have four servers. Each one has, um, you know, six drives, and they work together as the failure domain. Um, from traditional storage, it's it's a, within the enclosure. Uh, the two controllers work together to provide high availability and manage the, the uh, failure domain. From storage scaling, right, you can certainly uh, add, uh, for software-defined storage, add more nodes, add more disks. Again, if you've got failure domain islands in that large cluster, you, you don't necessarily have to get uh, less efficient with the actual storage as long as you stay within your, your failure domain island. You can have multiple failure domain islands making up that cluster, right? Again, I might have 32 node cluster for some reason. I might have eight four node failure domain islands so that I, I uh, don't necessarily have to carry the burden of trying to manage across a, a flat 32 nodes. Um, and in terms of HCI, now here's one of the issues with HCI sometimes is it's a building block approach, right? Uh, the amount of compute power, the amount of storage, and to some degree, the amount of networking scales in lockstep. So, yes, you can add more, and yes, there are guys who will have compute-heavy nodes that can be added to the cluster versus storage-heavy nodes, but essentially a lot of that infrastructure is carried forward as you're scaling. It's not uh, all, all or nothing kind of an approach. Um, within the, the uh, storage, uh, traditional storage, you can add more disks, more JBODs. Uh, ultimately, you could cluster uh, enclosures together uh, and have each failure domain be one enclosure. Uh, those are less prevalent. I mean, you, you've, there's some, some higher end storage that will do that. Um, but but it, the bread and butter is going to be adding more JBODs and more disks to you know, get up to, uh, to 100 terabytes or whatever. Storage cost, right, because of the number, it was a one socket. To have, for example, four to get started uh, can drive cost to be higher. Um, whereas on traditional storage, you can get an entry storage con controller for, you know, 10K, 15K, to, and, and you can be off and running pretty quickly. Again, from the efficiency standpoint, whether it be eraser codes or copies, there is overhead that has to happen on each of the nodes. And so you just got to be cognizant of what you're giving up and whether you're okay with that. Uh, on traditional storage, maybe higher because you actually can uh, use the full uh, usable space on the drives. Yeah, just one quick point on the storage cost element, and I see a comment in the chat about this, that 
as you scale, um, the, the software-defined solutions, really it depends on how much of that replication or erasure coding you have in place on the cost per additional gigabyte um, or terabyte um, in the solution. The other element you run into is that as a total solution cost level, if you have a hyper-converged infrastructure, you're amortizing the cost of the nodes because you're also getting your workload hosted at the same time as your storage capacity grows. So there, this is an equation that has lots of solutions depending upon the, the workload and the application. And that's why we see a continuation of traditional storage and software-defined converged and hyper-converged uh, in the industry. There isn't a, one clear answer for all. Yeah, and, and so there's another perspective, right? So eraser coding is used for failure recovery. Nobody in his right burdensome on the on the CPU. So I understand that the, there may be some perspectives along those lines, but but we're using eraser code as the nominal path is uh, pretty uh, rare. Um, so, you know, there is another question uh, concerning uh, about compression or dedupe in these architectures, um, as well as replication and so on. So, in, in general, you can make the argument that compression, dedupe, replication, mirroring, or some, you may even be able to make some claims for snapshots, that's independent of whether you're SDS or whether you're traditional. Now, there are SDS plays that have compression and dedupe and snapshots, maybe it's less of a number of snapshots you can take or on a per lun basis, but you can also do that on traditional storage. So it's a, it's a, it, it doesn't, uh, picking SDS versus traditional does not force some sort of uh, limitation or give up of compression and dedupe, at least at the conceptual level. If you pick, you know, product A, maybe he doesn't have it, product B might in either category. Um, okay, so now let's consider a couple future trends, right? From an NVMe standpoint, there's, there's enhancements going on in terms of um, performance or uh, managing the right leveling and so on. You've got uh, enhanced uses of namespaces, whether they be shared or whether they're streamed so that they, you can guide different classes of workload within a drive to the appropriate blocks. And there is even some speculation, uh, no one's publicly declared it yet, but there's been speculation that even HDDs might adopt NVMe only because it relieves the customer from having two storage stacks running in a system. So if he was doing peering or whatever, it would be more convenient to have NVMe across the board than saying, oh, yeah, the NVMe has got to talk to the SAS stack or the SATA stack to do any sort of replication kind of play. Yeah, and related to that NVMe point, what we are seeing in terms of the processor chipset capabilities, more PCI lanes supporting NVMe in particular and moving gen to gen in the PCI domain it's just increasing the amount of capability that will be on that single building block platform. So, you know, it's a, it's a bigger, better, faster, more argument, but it is one where, as, as I mentioned before, we're seeing the commodity server design points getting optimization for increased IO to support higher density of NVMe for storage rich configurations. Uh, before we, before you, you jump into the cloud, Fred, there's a question about how to choose the right best hardware for deploying SDS. Typically, it's uh, an x86 um, is a requirement only because of there'll be a Linux in play here, and there'll there'll be uh, you know that's a, a rallying point for software development and so on. Typically, you'll, you'll, you could look at the number of drive bays, right? Uh, as one of the ramifications of the impact of SDS. A lot of servers in the future are going to have even more drive bays than you currently see today because they're trying to be, quote, storage-rich servers, whether it be SDS or I've got a, I don't know, database appliance, whatever, right? Um, and, and the other piece would be the amount of memory that you might want, uh, and that would be defined by your software solution. 
And then finally, the, num the number of uh, I.O. adapter bays, depending on what kind of connectivity you're looking for. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's not a satisfying answer, but the answer I would give is it depends. So choosing the right hardware requires you to understand the workload that you're going to deploy on that hardware and what storage demands that has. So that drives you down a path of thinking about do you need higher performance versus higher capacity? Do you need tiering? Um, do you have hot spots in your data set? Those sorts of things will drive a decision matrix around what you ultimately want for your software-defined storage solution. Um, and, and then from there, it's a matter of kind of shopping the market for the right hardware footprint that meets all of those demands at the right price. And depending upon how much assembly you want to do versus how much you'd like to buy a canned solution, that will kind of flavor the, the shopping uh, excursion as you go out and look at the market. Certainly, there are a lot of pre-built software-defined solutions that you can go purchase, uh, you know, kind of complete at the curb. And then, of course, there's the do-it-yourself kit option where if you're uh, comfortable with all of the assembly and configuration, you can you know, get a, a reference architecture or a best practices guide and put it together yourself. Uh, in, in terms of the drives, there's a question about whether SDS can support flash drives or hard drives. Short answer is yes. I mean, you can get them where it's all flash drives, or you can get solutions where there's some flash drives either used as caching or as a, call it tier zero plus, or you can get solutions that are all hard drives. It's a statement of cost, statement of performance, preference, so on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the cloud. So how best to use it? Well, I, I almost replaced the word cloud in this slide with edge. Um, and I think that the, the reason I almost did that is because what we are seeing today with the advent of communication technology like 5G and the explosion of IoT um, in terms of the hype curve that we're on, this is an environment where a lot of data that previously wasn't being captured, wasn't being analyzed, um, is now being gathered. It's being stored for some period of time as long as we have the capacity to do it. And the goal is to do some analytics or to run some AI against it to get some deeper insight into a domain. Um, and, and that's something that is driving the storage networking conversation. Because even if you're not using cloud, an edge site has a limited bandwidth pipe from its local domain out to your core data center or to the cloud. Uh, so you layer on top of that constraint a set of concerns about security and whether data is visible in flight, whether it's crossing geopolitical boundaries for things that have to do with governance. Um, all of that becomes that or your storage solution in general has to grapple with. Um, the three models I would, I would recommend you just kind of consider if you take away from this conversation. Um, Having apps on-premise and data in the cloud, you get this big latency to, to access your data. The advantage is that you, the cloud provides you uh, resiliency, backup, and possibly uh, site migration if you have a disaster recovery scenario that involves that. For an app processing in cloud with the data on-premise, well, that works okay. You still have this latency problem. You keep your data. So if, if your data, it's important to you that your data stay um, resident at rest in your premise, um, that's, that's a, the, a model you might follow. But putting the application out in the cloud means that the data has to go out there sometime. And so that's an awkward situation without some additional um, caching algorithm or data shuttling algorithm in place. And then finally, that processing and data in the cloud. Everything out in the cloud is fine, but, but once your data is captive in the cloud, getting it back out of the cloud how it comes with a cost. Um, so this is one of these areas where your storage strategy needs to comprehend your compute strategy um, and the economics of it as you move forward in time. So there, before we get into it, uh, there is a question on the table about does SDS make sense for enterprise customers also or only for cloud? SDS uh, can be used both in the enterprise arena as well as in the cloud arena. There's no inherent uh, limitations of one of SDS that would prevent it from being a used as an enterprise solution. 
Yeah, and I think if you were to to look around, you you'd realize that a lot of software-defined storage solutions are just being packaged as components or optional features in your base operating system distribution. So there's 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 already a body of work being done to make that feel familiar to you anytime you cluster a set of servers running a particular OS that sort of solution is just already there prepackaged in the base distro to activate so you're seeing a lot of this is not being labeled specifically software defined storage but if you look at the under the covers that's exactly what's going on and that's because of this value of 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 having intelligent management of your uh, storage within a cluster of servers that are running a set of apps that cluster construct being matured to include the storage element is part of it. So if we look at SDS versus uh, tradi traditional storage in terms of trends, well, obviously the mind share of SDS is growing quickly, and there is some complexity and cost associated with it, but it is simpler to, to implement than, than worrying about corner cases for traditional storage or finding people who are, who are very familiar with the, the uh, traditional storage paradigm and dealing with all the specific appliances and so on. There's, uh, as I mentioned, there's limited, you know, the, the programming skills for traditional storage, ma mainly around the corner cases of power events, cache protection, so on, it, it, it can, can throttle some of the storage inno innovation, right? The, the effort really seems to be focused a lot more on the SDS side than the traditional side. Um, and, and the fact that you've got limited skills and have to do deep pockets in terms of uh, launching any sort of new traditional storage, there's some barrier to, to entry for, you know, startup or whatever, because he's got to actually have those skills on board to do that. And then finally, we talked a little bit about the solution cost. Um, there is some speculation, no products I'm, I'm personally aware of, uh, but there is speculation about, you know, looking at ARM. Right, either the drive down cost, or maybe I've got, you know, there, you may be aware there's the N, uh, NGD, which is actually looking at processing out in the drive, which is an ARM based solution, although it's still maturing, it's in its infancy. I wouldn't necessarily go out there and put a mission critical application on it yet, but, but it is maturing uh, well. And then, you know, this can lead to some new topologies in terms of uh, disaggregating the storage processing from the storage capacity. You might have, uh, for example, uh, could be a shared JBOD and, and you're using you know, either SAS zoning or NVMe namespaces to allow multiple processing units to access a pool of drives, uh, drive slices or whatever. There is, a quite, I, if I'm an enterprise customer who deploys SDS, who provides tech support if I have a problem? Uh, typically, that's going to be along the lines of uh, like your uh, uh, server um, admin and those kind of guys. You will. One of the benefits of SDS, as I sort of alluded to, is you don't have, a, have to have a special storage skill on hand to, for example, uh, babysit the storage, to track storage, to be the guy who creates a LUN for some application server, right? You, the the user or the Server admin can be empowered to go do those kind of things um, because, of, again, you don't have to worry about corner cases and, and so on. So it, it kind of removes the need of having a storage tower in, in the customer's shop. Yeah, and I, I would say that it depends on how you deploy your SDS. If you buy that CAN solution or utilize a uh, uh, an OS vendor provided component, well, your support's going to come from whoever sold you the solution or the OS vendor. If you're doing a roll your own sort of implementation with something from OpenStack, well then your support model is around the open community support and you maybe have a relationship with, with a third party service provider or a hardware provider that's going to help you assemble that. But those, there's, you know, it's again, it's an it depends kind of uh, answer because there are lots of ways you can deploy, acquire and create an SDS uh, configuration. All right, so in summary, um, you know, SDS is a storage stack and commodity hardware. Traditional uh, storage is really a storage stack, uh, proprietary perhaps, on targeted appliances. 
uh, purpose-built appliances. CIs to, can leverage SDS or traditional storage in a, um, a group of, of subsystems that, prov that provide the solution. It, HCI is taking SDS servers and networking and putting it into one platform, one box. And, uh, you know, on-premise cloud, collection of CI or ACI components, off-premise, you might have a CI or ACI interacting with the cloud for your storage needs. Fred, do you? Okay. Um, so um, that pretty much concludes our, our discussion on SDS versus traditional storage. Uh, I hope it was informative. Um, so I'd like to open it up to some uh, some questions, some further questions from uh, people. We would like to open that up, not just I. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ted. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate that. And while we wait for the last few questions to come in, I'll go ahead and just uh, let me back this. Oh, I'm sorry. We were on the right slide there. Let's go over a few things. Um, at the end of the presentation, we do uh, I appreciate your opinion, uh, so make sure you give us some feedback, uh, rate this webinar, tell us how we did, anything that we need to improve on, things like that. We'll use that information to make improvements in future presentations. As well, you can see down on your lower right-hand corner, I believe it is, there's an attachment so you can download a PDF of this presentation right now. As well, there will be a PDF of the slides posted on the network storage forum. You can see the website uh, right there in the, the URL. As well, we'll also post a, a full Q&A for all the questions that were done. So we'll post that as a blog. You'll be able to, to look back and uh, look at the archives to read all the questions and get the answers from the presenters. Uh, finally, if you could follow us on Twitter, uh, the, our handle is at SNEANSF. Um, I don't see any other questions at this point. We do have one more slide, though. Just want to let you guys know. Uh, we are in business of educating, and we do have quite a few uh, webcasts that are in our archive section. So some of the uh, uh, more popular ones we've listed here, I encourage you to go and check out the website, uh, see if you can find other topics you might be interested in, and you can view a, either an archive of the webcast or, again, download the presentations of those decks as well. I'll give you guys the last few minutes to get the last questions in. Uh, Ted, uh, um, anything else we want to cover at this point? Um, on behalf of Fred and myself, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and I hope this was informative and helpful. Fred? Yes, uh, indeed. This, is, this has been a great conversation, and uh, we appreciate the questions that have come in or are continuing to come in and the opportunity to uh, share a perspective with uh, the work group here. Uh, so let's look at what questions we have coming in. How does SDS affect storage networking? Are SAN OEMs going to lose customers? Um, well, Ted, I don't, I don't know if you have an opinion on this. I, I would say that Ethernet is the 800-pound gorilla. Uh, that's my perspective. Um, so when you talk about SAN, it remains relevant because of the niche of storage and the fact that storage is such a, a crucial part of the, the fabric of IT. Um, but for a lot of software-defined solutions, what we see is that Ethernet is the preferred way to, or the preferred fabric for software to find. Um, we've dabbled with things like PCI fabrics, uh, fiber channel fabrics, of course, iSCSI, that sort of thing, FCOE. Um, at the end of the day, routing protocols over Ethernet or having additional extensions to Ethernet to support storage is, is kind of my perspective of where I expect things to go. Um, does that mean that SAN OEMs lose customers? Um, I think it means that they will have to continue to innovate in order to keep relevance in in the market. Um, and and that's, that's true to all of us in the business of building server componentry for data centers. And, and you can take it one step further, right? There's an, a, a rich install base of fiber channel. Therefore, that represents a, a decent footprint for the SAN OEMs to continue to innovate, update, prosper. Uh, for example, there's NVMe over fiber channel as a uh, as an, uh, a fiber channel based or SAN based protocol that uh, people are uh, working to adopt. Uh, there's efforts in, for the Linux distros to embrace as well as uh, HBA vendors and uh, SAN OEM. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the install base of fiber channel is significant enough that I, I don't think fiber channel is just going to fall off a cliff in the next year. <laughs> 
Um, just cherry picking questions for the ones that I want to answer. Um, what is the best way to mitigate unpredictable network latency that can go out of bounds of storage required SLA? Um, this is this is an area that I, I really enjoy thinking about at least, um, if not practicing uh, fixing. Um, and I think there are there are a number of techniques available. So there are a lot of tricks. Tricks is probably the wrong word. Techniques that can be applied in the network to guarantee capacity and and route latency uh, in in limited topologies. So you know the more chaos you have in your network, the less determinism you're going to have on that round trip time. Uh, but for a rack local network of a high speed Ethernet link, you can uh, reliably count the number of hops and and if you implement your switch fabric correctly, guarantee that that traffic will always have a fixed amount of latency. So that's one technique. That's rather heavy handed in that it reserves part of the network for that. The other, the other direction, the other end of the spectrum that can be taken is you just simply uh, allow for the existing kernel stack primitives for handling a timed out IO to just do what they do. And as long as you don't have too many of those, you're a happy customer. Um, but but in, if you do have a bunch of those, and there's a number of, of nice virt, uh, visualization tools for I/O performance that you can instrument in your system, um, you, you want to do something to control environmental factors cause the latency to go out of bounds, and then either work to control those or eliminate them in your architecture. That's kind of the, you know, the, you, you can either fix it the hard way with, with a hard requirement or a hard constraint, or you can tune your system to avoid the situation on, on a heuristic best effort basis. And, and one, one step further, too, you know, assuming you want to be able to diagnose something like this coming up, right, the use of VLANs or, or in the case of fiber channel VSANs that would logically separate host traffic from cluster traffic or whatever, makes debugging this problem a year from now when someone has a problem much simpler than saying, I've got all this traffic all over the place, and you know, how do I figure out who's the bad guy, right? There are a couple questions here about scaling. SDS scaling in comparison with traditional storage, please elaborate, and how is scale support of SDS shaping up? So a perspective I have on this is that um, SDS has become relevant by starting small and solving the small problem, which is, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of the market, right? It's, it's big enough that it's interesting to a large body of customers. In doing so, decisions have been made that perhaps limit scalability and performance. Um, if it's important enough, the community, particularly for open solutions, will provide a solution because there's an economic or technical incentive to do so. But I would, I would say that today, a lot of the SDS solutions out there do have either question marks in the scalability column because they haven't been proven out at that level of scale, or they in, intentionally have uh, elected not to support scale at the uh, the benefit of being simple to deploy and and deterministic in their performance at that low scale. Um, so, you know, compared to traditional storage, there's been a tremendous investment in the traditional storage domain to make sure that at least some segment of the product market supports the biggest scale because there's, there's generally speaking, a good payment for the, the vendor that can provide that kind of a solution, especially if they're the sole source vendor. Um, but, you know, it's a limited number of customers who need that massive amount of scale and the ways in which we deliver the scale with performance, with redundancy, resiliency, those sorts of characteristics, those demands vary from customer to customer. So this is one of these elements where, you know, SDS is, is growing organically because it's found, a, it's found a market segment that has the demand, it's economically viable for them, it's simple enough to deploy, and as long as there's continued momentum, it'll continue to grow in the scale domain. So, so my uh, a little different perspective, right? So when, when you have SDS and you're trying to scale, right, obviously you're scaling nodes subject to your failure domains. Could be two nodes with a tiebreaker, could be four nodes, fine. Point is you, you, you could scale that way with SDS. Now, I, I, would, I would propose or proffer to you that 
one 32 node cluster has more trouble to configure to manage to deal with than two 16 node clusters, right? So if there's an ability to to not try to go huge, other than you know perhaps Ceph where it's more of a capacity play, there's benefits to doing that. On the traditional storage side, you know the vast majority of those will be two controller enclosures and you're really just scaling the amount of capacity behind it. You pick the, the controllers you want for the performance you're after when you do that initial purchase. Um, you may upgrade to new controllers in the same enclosure or whatever, um, or in some cases like uh, uh, IBM SVC or whatever, you could actually cluster controllers together. I see we've hit the top of the hour, and I want to respect everybody's time. I uh, appreciate all of the questions, and, uh, and thanks again from Ted and myself for the opportunity to uh, share our perspectives with the forum. Uh, Tim, we'll hand it over to you to close. Great. I, I want to thank you both, Ted, for an excellent job today. Again, we will have a, a blog with the remainder of the questions that we didn't get to within the presentation here, as well as the, uh, a link to a PDF that will be posted on the, on the uh, NSF SNEA website. Uh, thanks again for attending. Again, one last time, please provide your feedback before you go if you haven't yet, and thank you for joining. Thank you. Goodbye.